All right, so what do we hope to accomplish today? Some of our learning intentions. First, we're going to explore some high quality resources for phonological, phonics, and spelling that will enhance your instruction. I think it's really also important that we understand what those terms mean. All those PH words can get confusing sometimes. So I wanna make sure we have an understand of what are the phonological skills? How is that different from phonics and phoneme instruction? Um, if I'm telling you it's important to do these things with kids, I think it's really important that we understand why. Why are we making sure that kids have these strong, solid foundations? Okay, just to warm us up today, we are going to play a Kahoot game. So I'm going to bring it up here on the screen. And if you have a device, um, there's going to be a code that comes up. And what I would like you to do is go to the website that is www.kahootit.com. So here's the website at the top. Once you get to that website, you can enter this code and enter your name to join the game. So I'll give everyone a couple minutes just to access that game. If you have any questions or you're having trouble, let us know. Okay, starting to see some people enter the game. Numbers are going up. Okay, we'll wait about 30 more seconds. Hopefully everyone can get in by that time. Jen. Yes. This is Deb Kaufman. Um, I'm trying to get in, but I keep getting an error message. www.kahoot. Yes, the website is right here. If you go to this website and then click in this code on the screen. Okay. Okay, does anyone need more time? We good? If you are not logged in, you can still play along. If you don't have a device, that's perfectly okay. Yeah, and I can't find the code. Where, where is the code at? It's this one, 717-8299. Seven one seven eight two nine nine. you said? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and start the game. Okay, so first question, we can predict how well kids will read before we teach them to read. So on your device, please either put that as true or as false. Okay, so we had 32 people say true and 12 say false. That is actually true. And we're going to learn today that why that is true is because these phonological skills that we teach kids, before we even teach them to read, all this manipulation we do with sound actually is the foundation and it will predict how well kids do when they're presented with print. All right, next warm up question. 
True or false, 67% of fourth graders read below grade level. Is that true or is that false? You did good on that one. That is sadly, that is true. So that is a really high number. And a lot of that is attributed to um, not having a strong phonics foundation. So we're gonna talk about resources today that can hopefully make sure your learners have that strong phonics foundation. All right, next question, true or false? 20% of special ed referrals are linked to a deficit in decoding skills. Is that true or false? Okay, that is actually false, and that number is actually 80%. So that is a huge, huge reason why kids are being referred to special ed. And even a lot of times older teachers, like fourth and fifth grade teachers that come and say, oh, my kids really can't comprehend. Most of the time, those comprehension problems are even related to decoding. So that phonics instruction is super important. Okay. Reading and writing are not natural to our brain. Our brains were not designed to read and write. Is that true or false? Good job, believe it or not, that is true. So if you took any of the letters trainings, we talk about the four parts in our brain and our brains were not designed to be readers. So if we think about how kids learn, kids usually learn to talk by about age one, but how many years with good explicit instruction does it take for them to become readers and writers? So that's just more proof of why we have to make sure our phonics instructed is explicit and systematic. All right, last question. What percentage of oral languages have a written component? So that is usually pretty shocking to people when we think about all of the oral languages, there's only 10% that have that reading and writing component. So again, that's kind of saying um, how this is not natural to our brains. All right, so thanks for playing along. Just a little warm up to show us and get us into how important this idea of teaching these phonological and phonic skills are. Tracy, do we have any questions in the chat or are we good to keep going? Nope, we're good to keep going. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to jump right into these phonological skills. So how I wanted to start was I wanted to make sure that everyone has a strong understanding of what what is phonological skills and what are our ph phonemic awareness. So when we think of phonological skills, I want you to think of that as an umbrella term and underneath that there are many sub skills. So these phonological activities are all activities where there's absolutely no print involved. So this is a lot that we do in preschool, a lot that we do in kindergarten to lay the foundation for when we're going to present kids with print. So when we teach these phonological skills, it's very important to teach them in a specific order. We want to go from the simplest to the hardest. So the simplest would be understanding that we can count the words orally in a sentence. So kids know that sentences are made up of words. Then we move into syllables. So we want kids to be able to hear a word. We want them to be able to count the number of syllables. So if I say sunshine, they would be able to say that the syllables are sun, shine, and tell me there are two parts in that word. We also want them to be able to blend. So if I say table, 
can they blend those and make that into a word and say table. So that's the largest chunk. After kids have mastered that, then we move into onset rhyme. So onset is the beginning sound up to the vowel. So if my word is sun, the onset would be s and the rhyme would be un. So this is getting a little bit harder because we're breaking it into smaller chunks. So we want them to be able to break it apart and we also want them to be able to blend that back together. The most difficult of all the phonological awareness activities is breaking it into a phoneme. And a phoneme is just a sound, a, a single sound. So if I said the word cat, the phonemes in cat are k, at. There's three phonemes. So this is critical because if we have kids that can't hear all the sounds in a word, what's going to happen when we ask them to become spellers? So if I say the word stop and they hear stop, when they try to map the print to it and put letters to that, they're not going to be very successful at spelling. So this is where it comes into, if we can get them very strong in this at the sound level, then they're going to be successful when we add print, okay? So just kind of a little overview so you understand what all these terms are. Here I linked an article, um, and this is just one that you can read at a later time. This is written by Louisa Motes and Carol Tolman. They're both national letters trainers, so they're authors of some of the letters books that you might have taken. This just talks about why is this so important, what happens if kids don't have these skills. So a lot of times what happens, we think kids are strong and then we get to the end of first grade, second grade, and we see these skills are missing and then they start to have reading and writing problems, okay? And then just a little bit of research that the two best predictors of, of how well kids will learn to read are the phonemic awareness. So can they hear all those sounds in words and letter knowledge? So this is really important because it's really going to influence how well kids learn to read. We see this a lot of times in Dibble scores or Ames Web scores. Um, kids that tend to be read in kindergarten on these phonological skills tend to be read in first and second grade when they're doing oral reading, as opposed to those kids that are green, that green continues to carry through once they become readers and writers. This is just one other article. Um, it's actually from ASCD, and it's an excerpt from a book that talks about why are these skills so important. And then at the end of this chapter that's listed here, it gives you a whole bunch of little activities to enhance the phonological and phonemic awareness skills in kids. So you can start incorporating these into your classrooms. And these are even very simple things that you can share with parents to be doing with their kids while they're at home. All right, so the first resource that I want to share with you, and Haggerty has really become popular um, over the last year or so. Um, I have a lot of districts that said they felt like their curriculum was missing some of those phonological and phonemic awareness skills. So they incorporated Haggerty and they saw great achievements in their kids. So is there anyone that's on that is using Hegarty that would like to share anything about what you've seen from using this? Anyone? Hi, I'm Lindsay Ewart. Um, I'm from Northern Bedford. Hi, um, Lindsay. I started this year using Hegarty. I teach kindergarten. Okay. And when we first looked at it, at the beginning of the year, we were like, wow, there's no way that this is, good. you know, it looked like a lot, but the kids, they picked up on it so fast. Awesome. And then when we went to get into more phonemic awareness skills, they picked up those skills a lot easier because we're doing them with them every day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we notice a huge difference and we really like it a lot. Fantastic. Awesome. Good, good. And we hear that from many, many districts. I even have districts that I work with that are purchasing this for the preschools that feed their district because they've seen so much success with it and they want those kids to have that foundation coming into kindergarten. So, hi, Jen. Hi. Hi. I used the uh, freebies that were online in my preschool. Yes. And the kids just totally, it, they went to it. it. It was a huge success. Good, good. And that's coming from a preschool teacher that, you know, in preschool, we want that exposure. But what seems to be happening is the kids are actually mastering it. And then they're entering kindergarten, being ready to read so much earlier. So thanks for sharing. Jen, may I jump on? I'm going to kind of piggyback off of Melissa's um, comment. 
I supervise our EI program for our okay. kids with special needs and developmental delays. And not this year, but last year, we implemented Hegarty in all of our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, like the teachers at first were like, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But we have seen great success with this. So just Fantastic. even if they're not, you know, really digesting it, they're at least being exposed to it. That's right. So we're seeing some wonderful um, um, success with that. Good, good. And that's even with, with a lot of learners that might have some developmental delays. So that's fantastic that they're seeing growth. So just to show you what this looks like, Hegarty is meant to be whole group and it's meant to be about 10 minutes a day of um, instruction. So we do this with everyone. So if we just pull up a lesson, um, what's really nice about Hegarty is it gives you a whole week so this is a whole week of lessons it's done orally the teacher says the words and the students respond so it's that repetitiveness and the way the program is designed it cycles back through so they are continuing reviewing these skills so at first and it, it moves rather quickly and the teacher does motions with it so it's fast paced so at first some of your learners might be struggling but with that repetitiveness every single day you're going to start to see that those skills um, they become very successful at those skills so this is what a typical lesson plan looks like like I said about 10 minutes now normally Hegarty is a paid product so I believe right now it's $79 and you get so one teacher would need a book um, and that would give you lessons for the entire year Right now, what they have done is they have put everything from about the time school closures happened till the end of the year online. So you can access all of these lesson plans um, to do with, with your kids. What's really nice is there's also videos. So a lot of different sites have videos. Patton even has a YouTube channel just for Hegarty videos. Um, you can watch teachers actually teach these lessons and you can even share these with parents. So parents are doing these at home. I have um, a five to a five year old niece and nephew and I share these with them and my sister says they love them. She puts it on and they, she said the first day they kind of struggled, but they are really loving it. So I'm just going to put a lesson on just so you can see um, a little bit of what this looks like. stop it there because I think you have an idea so what I want you to remember is these that went a little bit fast but those kids would have had those lessons from the beginning of the year okay so a very quick 10 minutes um, just repetitive of those phonological and phonemic awareness skills any questions on Hegarty And if this is something that you want to purchase, like I said, right now, everything is free for you and those videos will always be free. This is what the book looks like. So there's a pre-K, a kindergarten and a primary version that you would do with your kids. That's all the teacher needs and everything is in there for you. It tells you exactly what to say just to reinforce those skills. All right, good. All right, so we're going to move a little bit away from phonological and phonemic awareness because once that is solid, then we can start adding phonics. 
So when we talk about phonics, this is when we add the print. So it's that the kids understand that letters represent sounds. And when we blend those words together, we're going to make words and we're going to become readers and writers. This is a uh, resources that I found. I've always used really great reading as a decoding survey. And I know some of you might use this for diagnostic surveys, but they have this whole home connection right now, which is really fantastic. So if we go to this first link, this is their home connection page. If we look at the things in purple, these are resources um, that we can use. And then in the green, these are their programs and their resources that they have opened up. And these are all free right now. So let's take a look at the purple buttons first. So this purple button, this first one, if you were going to share this with parents or if you wanted to use this um, interactively with your kids, this would be perfect to use in Zoom meetings. This is just a crash course that explains some of their resources and how to do this. So it's designed for parents, but it, um, teachers can absolutely use it too. So I would really suggest watching that. Whoops. This is a letter free tile play. And this is awesome, not only for phonics, but you could also use this for um, phonological and phonemic awareness. So this is just a letter tile board. And if you use Alcona boxes, this is very similar to Alcona boxes. Alcona boxes are just sound boxes. When we're asking kids to write, um, sounds are abstract. So sometimes we use letter tiles to hold the place to know that this is where we're going to have to put a letter. So if we were working at spelling and we're doing CVC words, we might say to the kids, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to push up all the sounds in cat. So they would say, K -A -T. so we warm up with that phonological phonemic awareness to make sure they can hear the sounds. Now we can map the print. So I can bring down my letters and I can spell K -A -T. what's, whoops. I can spell. So there my word is cat. Okay, so this is awesome for word building. And then at the bottom, um, let me move my toolbar here, you can just clean that up by hitting that bar. So if you look at the top, they also have, if you have kids that are a little bit older and you're working on vowel teams, vowel teams can be hard because we have to combine letters. So these actually become a grapheme tile where we put the letters together to help kids learn it. So if they're writing the word said and you want them to, or the word, um, that's not a good one. Let's say the word play, you have those sounds together so they know that when I see an A and a Y together, it's going to make that A sound, okay? So they're advanced vowel teams. Then if you're working on prefixes and suffixes, we have cards for the prefix and suffixes the chunks, and then others, there's capital letters, and then they also put the letters in red for the vowels. So if we're working with younger kids and we're trying to distinguish the difference between what is a letter and a vowel and what is a consonant, that's really important when we do syllable types, we can actually have them put those vowels in red to call attention to the vowels, okay? So this is the letter-free uh, tile. This is free until the end of the school year. So all you would have to do is share this link with parents or you can use this in a Zoom link and kids can actually manipulate this. You can give them control and they can manipulate and build words and you can do lessons with them. Any questions on the letter free play tiles? Good. There is a, this is awesome in the comments. Oh, good, good. We can hear those kind of comments. Fantastic. All right. So if we go back here. All right. The next thing that I want to share with you is heart word magic. So when we think about sight words, a sight word is basically a word that we want kids to recognize automatically. Sometimes they are decodable. Sometimes they are not decodable. So sometimes these sight words have tricky parts to them. So if I look at the word said, we want said to be a word that kids recognize automatically. But if you look at that vowel sound, it's the eh sound. So it really should be spelled with the E. So the way our brain learns to read, we're always looking for patterns. 
So if you've taken letters, we talk about heart words and letters. So instead of telling kids, I want you to memorize the word said, what we teach them is there are parts of that words that we can decode and there's only one part that we need to learn by heart. So I want you to watch this video on how we would teach a heart word. Let's examine the word said, as in, mom said to take off your shoes. Said rhymes with words you know, like did and bed. Let's see if we can figure out which parts of said we know and which parts we have to learn by heart. Said has three sounds. S, e, d. The first sound, s, is spelled with the letter S. The last sound, d, is spelled with the letter D. We can read these parts using our phonics knowledge. The middle sound, e, short e, is spelled with the letters a, i. This is the one part we have to know by heart. We might see the word said in different shapes, colors, and sizes. Said, 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 said. These all have the same letters, and they all say said. Now let's see if you can remember how to spell the word said. Eh, said. We can use our phonics knowledge to spell the first and the last sounds. The first sound is how do we spell? Yes, the letter S. The last sound is D. How do we spell D? The letter D. The middle sound, E, eh, is the part we have to learn by heart. Do you remember how to spell E eh in this word? You're right. We use the letters A-I. S-A-I-D said. Remembering heart words is easier when we know there is just one part to learn by heart. Okay, so when we talk about phonics instruction, we say that we want to be explicit. So this is an example of explicit teaching that teaches them, you know, what part do we really need to pay attention to? So there is a whole host of videos on here, and you'll see they keep adding new ones, um, and this just keeps expanding. So I think this is a great way to introduce these words that are tricky. And then if we want to reinforce that practice, there are actually worksheets, but these, I don't really consider these worksheets because this is where kids are actually um, <clears throat> using worksheets that look like Alcona boxes and they are highlighting that tricky part and they are stretching out those sounds. So this is a teaching tool, I would say, rather than a worksheet. But this is an, I think, an awesome resource um, to help us teach those tricky words to kids. Any questions? Fantastic, so we'll keep going through. So if we look down here at the bottom, these are resources that you can use um, to teach. These can actually be used as um, tier ones, and some of these can be year used as tier two. What I really like about this resource is when we look at it, like there are, um, where is it? A, a linking chart. So, so many times we look at alphabets and the target words that they give kids are not correct. For example, many times short E is egg. That's a really bad example because short E says eh, not a. Eh. These are all accurate. So this linking chart is perfect and it's, it's really good to use this for instruction. So I, I really like how that corresponds. In here, um, this is also countdown directions of how you would teach these lessons. These would be kindergarten lessons here. And then there are decodable passages. So we, when we think about phonics instruction, we want to be very systematic and explicit in our instruction. We want to have a scope and sequence, and we want to connect it to text. And that's exactly what this does. So it tells you the skill that they are practicing, and then there's decodable text that you can apply that skill. So, so many times when we teach phonics, we teach the skill in isolation and we forget the part about adding the piece of text so kids can practice that word in passages and then phonics doesn't stick as well. So using these, these decodable passages is an awesome resource um, to make those phonics skills stick. 
Also, um, sometimes we see um, teachers struggle with spelling lists because if we look at spelling lists, maybe for one week, there's five or six different patterns in a spelling list, and that's really confusable to kids. So what tends to happen is kids memorize those words and they don't understand why they're spelled that way. These spelling lists are spelled and organized by patterns. So if you need some help looking at um, spelling lists to supplement, this would be a great resource to look at because it's going to make sense in the patterns that they teach. So like I said, this first box, um, this would be what we would use if we have kindergarten teachers. BLAST, this is going to be a K to two. We can use this as a tier one, but if you teach older kids um, up to fourth grade, you could use this as an intervention. So same kind of things here. They have decodable passages and you'll notice that they also add fluency passages. No fluency passages in kindergarten because kids are still mastering that accuracy. So um, in first grade, once they start to become accurate, then we can work on building some fluency with kids um, just to support their comprehension, okay? And there's also spelling lists in here. And then same thing, um, this one, HD, would be uh, used for grades two through 12. And boots and blah, this one is three through 12, okay? So any questions on this resource? Okay. Um, when did when did you say blast begins? Blast is uh, first. Can, it would be K through two. You could use it. And then you said up to grade four for intervention. Yes, that is correct. Second to fourth for intervention. Correct. Yep. Just Anything a reminder: else? the slide with all these links are going to be posted. I've been posting the. Um, the link in the chat so you can get to the slides later on today and you can get to all these links. Awesome, thank you, Tracy. And what I try to do on the page before here, I try to pull all of these out. So, um, you know, if you want the letter tile free, the, the heart word video, so you don't have to, if you forget, forgot where it was, you can use this page as your resource. Okay, awesome. All right, next phonics resource that we are going to go to is West Virginia Phonics. So West Virginia Phonics was a free resource and then it became a paid resource. Um, you couldn't access it for free anymore. Oops, I need to log in here. <clears throat> and now it is free again, but it is housed in a different place. So West Virginia Phonics is a fantastic resource for teaching phonics skills and it has a complete scope and sequence. So if we think about phonics instruction, we want to make sure that we have a scope and sequence so we are covering and teaching explicitly all the skills that we need to teach. If we are relying on look, pulling a piece of text and finding that skill in the text, what could happen is we could miss skills. So I want you to kind of think about flip-flopping. We use this, we have the skill that we're going to teach, then we find a piece of text to reinforce that skill. So what's nice about West Virginia Phonics is the entire scope and sequence is here for you. The lesson planning is done and it's very explicit, systematic lesson planning. So when you look at these lessons, there's always going to be a warm up. So when we talk about phonics instruction, we always want to warm up some phonologically first. So we're warming up that brain and we're asking them to think about the sounds before we move into the print. And that's exactly the way these lessons are designed. It also has an I do, we do, you do. So during the I you, the teacher is doing all of the modeling. The we do is the time that you do it together. That's your teaching time, making sure that kids get to about 80% accuracy. Then you can switch it over to the you do where you put it on the, the learners and see how they mastered this. What's also nice about West Virginia Phonics is there's always word work built in. So we're doing work to understand what's the pattern, what's the, what's the phonics uh, pattern happening here. Then there's a dictation. So if we can take, you know, we're manipulating it and we're using these words, now with dictation, we're asking kids to spell it. So not only are we asking them to read it, but they're doing the opposite, they're spelling it. So it kind of takes that lesson and makes it full circle. And then finally, we have text that they are able to read. 
um, to re so here's the word list, the, the words that you're going to see in the stories, and then there's passages to practice that. So if you think about it, you're reading it, you're spelling it, and then you're reading it in a passage. So it takes a full circle for phonics instruction. I know there are some districts that's you that are using West Virginia Phonics. Anyone want to um, speak to West Virginia Phonics or how it's working for you or how you're using those resources? This is Andy. Hi, I Andy. Using it this year at Claysburg. Um, some of my other teachers are on here, so you can jump in too if you uh, feel. We're using it actually for some interventions mm -hmm. um, as we have started to test our students more and more. Uh -huh um and the ones you know we were able to group them then and i know like where the weaknesses are and i we pull those and meet with our interventions groups daily so we use it in that way absolutely very nice yeah so either as a you know, two one or intervention someone else since we didn't get to test at the end of the year we can't tell you how well it worked but the teachers I, like <laughs> that's a bummer like i know everybody like we talk about PSSAs. I was disappointed because teachers do such hard work with TDA that we'll never see the results, but we will next year. But I know, I, yeah, yeah, that's okay though. All right. Anyone else have anything to share about West Virginia Phonics? There's a question in the chat. Is this program free right now? Yes, this is free right now. And I think it's going to be free for a while, at least till the end of the year. Um, it didn't say that it's going to be paid, you have to pay for it next year, but there's nothing that couldn't stop you from downloading these things, you know, and saving them um, to have as a resource. Other questions? This is very, very well done. I, I really like West Virginia Phonics and, you know, if you're looking for either a phonics program or something to supplement what you already do, I would absolutely recommend West Virginia Phonics. Awesome. Okay. Next thing I want to share with you, and Angie, you kind of led right into this when you were saying about how you're testing some of your learners to see where they are falling. Um, in the past, with a lot of districts, I've used the really great reading surveys, um, but in my research, what I discovered is they have really expanded them and they have changed a little bit. So if you click on the first link, it will take you to this page that gives you all of their surveys that they have. These are always free. So all you have to do is click on the link and they'll ask you to sign up. And then what will happen is they will send them to you in an email. And I linked this page because there are really nice videos that explains exactly what's being assessed in these diagnostics. So just to make sure everyone understands the difference between a benchmark and a diagnostic. So a benchmark is something like Dibbles or Ames Web, where we do these usually three times a year with kids. And it gives us a sense of how they're doing. Like, are they on track? Are they below track? but it doesn't necessarily tell us where their skill deficits are. So when you use a diagnostic, a diagnostic is going to drill down to what do I need to teach them in the classroom? So a lot of times these are used to form intervention groups and make sure that we are instructing kids on exactly what they need. If you think about intervention time, we don't always have a lot of time with those kids. So if we use something like a diagnostic, it's going to narrow down exactly what they need. So if they have mastered digraphs and blends, I don't need to teach that. I need to move on to something that they have not mastered, especially for the time constraints that we have for interventions. So we're gonna go through these, but I just wanted you to see this page that kind of outlines what all of those surveys are. Um, Jen, yes. Can, can we circle back just real quick? There was a sure. question about the West Virginia phonics. Yes. If absolutely. it would be appropriate for K plus. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So I would say like uh, K to two would be where we would use the West Virginia phonics. However, many times uh, kids above second grade still have phonics deficits. So I would say for kids that are getting intervention. Um, that would be, you could use them even higher once we figure out, you could use these surveys to figure out where their gaps are, and then you could pull from West Virginia Phonics. You wouldn't have to go through from beginning to end, but you can pull resources based on where their deficits are. Any other questions? Okay, all right. 
So first one that we are going to uh, talk about is this phonological survey. And this is given in kindergarten. So remember, phonological, no print. This is all being able to manipulate the sounds. So in, it's used in kindergarten and it's, whoops, it's going to assess blending words. It's going to assess syllables. Can they blend syllables together? Onset rhyme and phoneme identification. It will ask them beginning sounds and it will ask them ending sounds. So normally this is what we do in kindergarten and we would want this to be mastered by about December. Okay, so it, I put the link here. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right to the survey and then this tells you what is being assessed. Okay, if you want to get more involved, this is a new um, decoding or new uh, diagnostic survey that you can use in kindergarten. Much, much, much more involved. And it's actually broken down beginning, middle, and end of the year. And the assessment changes a little bit um, based on the time of year. So in the beginning of year in kindergarten, the first thing it's going to talk about is functional words. So point to the picture that is first, point to the picture in the middle, which one is above, which one is below. It's going to assess all of those things. It's also going to assess rhyming. Can we point to the rhyming words? Beginning sounds. So if I say a word, can you produce that beginning sound? It's going to do all the things that the phonological survey did. Blending of syllables, onset rhyme, and phonemes. It also has letter identification and sound identification. It incorporates basic CVC words. So these are all the short vowel words. Um, mostly, and, and kids encounter these in kindergarten, and then it's going to give you high frequency words. So it's a lot more involved than that phonological survey, um, and it would be a little bit longer to administer, but it's going to give you some really good information to see where your kids are and where you need to get them to be. Same survey, middle of the year. In the middle of the year, the functional words are not assessed anymore because it is assumed that um, that is already mastered. Same phonological skills, so that whole middle section is the same. And then they're going to add simple CVC sentences. So words that contain, you know, all those short vowel words like cat and son and mom, uh, words like that. End of the year, same as the middle of the year, but now they're asking kids to add phoneme deletion and addition. So if I said the word cat, take off the k, what word do we have? We have at. If I have the word top and I asked you to add a s at the beginning, what word do I get? So this, if we can get kids to master this phoneme deletion and addition, uh, by the end of kindergarten, it will be very, very solid. And what research is telling us is you will not see as much of a slippage over the summer. Okay, so that would be a goal to get at the end of the year. These, I know there's a lot of information on these diagnostic surveys. If you want to, you know, meet with me uh, during office hours times, I would be more than happy to go over these surveys with you because it's a lot of information for just one hour. All right. First grade um, foundational skills, again, assess different assessments for beginning, middle, and end of the year. In the beginning of the year, we're asking them to read CVC words. We're asking them to read CVC words that add blends and digraphs, simple CVC words, and nonsense CVC words. So that nonsense part, that's really making sure that they have those skills in place and they haven't just memorized those words. Middle of the year, everything from the beginning of the year with the addition of words and sentences, now they're adding some simple vowel teams. So this is kind of nice because sometimes in kindergarten, um, if we don't assess this, we don't know where to go next with the kids. So I like how they're expanding this a little bit. And then multisyllabic words that are addressing closed syllables, magic E syllables, and simple vowel teams. So I think that is a great addition just to continue to push those kids. Because sometimes if we look at the benchmark assessments that they have to do, you know, they're not just reading CVC words. They have to really dive into um, some of these other syllable types. And then end of the year is going to be similar to that middle of the year assessment. Questions on that one? Okay, I believe we have one more to go over. Um, this is, uh, might be, 
one that some of you are familiar with. This is the Diagnostic Decoding Survey. And some you a lot of people use this to put kids into groups to see exactly where their strengths and where their weaknesses are. Normally, we would give this in first grade, anywhere from first grade and above. But now what they're recommending is this does not start until second grade and we use the first grade one instead, that first grade foundational, use in first grade and save this one and wait till second grade. Okay, so how this is assessed. This is a student sheet. And then there is a teacher recording sheet. So this is really gonna break down where your kids are having any kind of decoding issues. The way this works is it goes from the simplest to the most complex, and it begins with just basic sight words. So if you give this to a student, if they read the word correctly, you let it alone. If they make an error over on this side, you're going to record what their error was. For example, if the word is rag and they said rig, their error was in the short vowel. So I would put an X in the short vowel column. What that does is it tracks their errors. And then by the end, if you see, oh my goodness, they made nine short vowel errors, that's something that I need to make sure I am cleaning up and addressing because that's really going to be a problem when they're trying to decode unfamiliar or multisyllabic words, okay? Then it does the words in a sentence, same thing, you code them the same way, and then it gives you nonsense words and you code them over here. If students miss less than five on this one, then we're going to move to the advanced decoding survey. Always give the beginning one first. And what you're gonna see here is the majority of these words are nonsense words. So we're really testing to make sure they have those spelling patterns in place and they haven't just memorized the words. Do it the same way, the same kind of recording sheet. If they get it right, leave it alone. If they miss it, just mark where they made their error. And then at the bottom, it has multisyllabic nonsense words and multisyllabic real words. This is really telltale. If you have kids that are trying to do every single sound, that probably means you need to um, add some syllable work so they can start recognizing them as chunks rather than trying to decode the entire word. Okay, so nonsense words and then real words that are multisyllabic. So questions on the um, beginning or advanced decoding survey? Yes. And like this, yes. After we give the survey, then we use the West Virginia Phonics to teach deficits. You're, you're reading my mind. <laughs> That's exactly right. So the resources that I showed you through um, the really great reading, those resources that were in there, and the West Virginia Phonics, if these would be used for interventions, then we can start to pull those resources to give kids exactly what they need. Other questions? All right, awesome. Okay, these are just some additional resources that I found um, that you can explore on your own time. We did talk about West Virginia Phonics. Um, I know some of you use 95% group, but they now are offering a free home resource that has some materials in there. Um, Teach Monster is, is a um, app that kids can kind of work through on their own. Um, we know ABC Mouse, um, Flyleaf Publishing, these are decodable books and um, half pints decodable books. So these are just resources that you can check out on your own that are also mostly all free. I think this is the only one that has some paid resources in it. But if you're looking through those and you have any questions, um, do not hesitate to contact me. Okay, last thing I wanna do in the chat, if you could please write one thing that you learned today and then if you have a question that you may still have or a topic or maybe something that we talked about today that you would like to further explore. So if you could just add that to your chat. If you can't find the chat, click on the three buttons and that should bring up the chat for you. While everyone's adding that, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to unmute and I would be happy to talk about any of those with you. Jen, one thing I did notice on the West Virginia Phonics page, there was a 
purchase order form. So I don't know if that means that they will be going to paid. That's possible, but they also have some resources, like they have mm. cards and things like that. So I think that might be what that purchase order is for. Okay. Lots of activity in the chat. Good, good. And like I said, if anyone has anything you want to unmute, please feel free to unmute. Yes, that 80% of special ed referrals was surprising to me. Yeah, uh, it's, it's amazing the power of, you know, explicit phonics instruction. When we equip kids to be able to, you know, decode words and decode multisyllabic words, because when they're reading, if they can't access the words and they can't decode, there's absolutely no room left for comprehension. So it all just falls apart. So it really begins with, you know, using these kind of resources and explicitly teaching phonics um, to equip kids with what they need. There are some kids that will just get it, but the majority of kids will not, and especially our strugglers. They are the ones that need that explicit systematic instruction, which I'm sure you can attest to. Okay, so that is um, basically all I have for today, but please feel free um, if you want to access the recordings and the webinars, um, if you would like to meet with me to further discuss any of these things, here's my email address. Um, I love literacy, so I would be happy to talk about any of these things with any of you.